Good afternoon, everybody. This is Glenn Greenwald. Welcome to a special live episode of System Update here on our home on Rumble, where I want to examine as many parts of the very dangerous and complex war that is taking place between Russia and Ukraine and already involving in various non-military ways, multiple other countries, including certainly the United States. And whenever you say that a new war has erupted and that it involves the two largest nuclear powers on the planet, which are still Russia and the United States. In fact, Russia has more nuclear warheads than any country on the planet, followed closely behind by the United States. And those two countries are way out in front from their Cold War arsenal still 20 times more, at least, than China and France, which are the next leading nuclear powers. A lot of these nuclear systems still run on archaic Cold War era systems involving hair trigger alerts and all sorts of other systems that allow for miscommunication. The United States and the and, and then the then Soviet Union have come very, very close to nuclear war on at least two and probably more occasions in the past. And so whenever there's a war that those two countries are involved in on opposite sides, even if not yet directly militarily, and hopefully it will never be, but even if it is an extremely dangerous situation, the dangers of which should never be underestimated. Now, in addition to being dangerous and being incredibly complex, I think it's really worth taking a step back and thinking about the climate the, that gets created whenever a war, particularly one of importance to the United States and to its Western allies and NATO and to a country as large as Russia, a new war breaks out because a lot of things happen that I think are worth thinking about within our own brains whenever that happens. Now, I think it's not a controversial statement to make. In fact, it's barely debatable that war is the single worst thing that can happen to humanity, that a new war and the eruption of a new war is the single worst episode that can possibly happen to the planet. The gravest and worst atrocities throughout history have been ones committed in the name of or under the cover of war, and war itself is just intrinsically heinous. So it's always an extraordinarily horrific episode to watch a new war break out anytime. That's just always true. And precisely for that reason, we react very emotionally to the outbreak of a new war, as we should, given that it generally means that large numbers of human beings, innocent civilians are going to have their lives extinguished. Bombs are falling, destroying cities, destroying ancient structures, disrupting lives, causing thousands or hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of displaced human beings, whoever we assign blame to for that war, we naturally are going to have a huge amount of intense emotion toward that country of rage and anger and a desire for vengeance. And conversely, we're going to have an enormous amount of sympathy and a desire to help and protect and defend whoever we regard as the victim. It's for any normal, healthy, well-adjusted human being, a time of extremely high emotions. And I think we need to be aware of that for two reasons. The first of which is that anytime we're in a state of high emotions, by definition, necessarily, our capacity to reason diminishes. If we're reacting to something with intense emotions, our ability to use rationality to react to the situation, to analyze it, is crowded out by the intensity of those emotions, even when those emotions are valid. In fact, particularly when those emotions are valid as the emotions that are pervasive now watching what's happening between Russia and Ukraine undoubtedly are. It doesn't matter whether the emotions are valid or not. The mere existence of intense emotions means that we lose our capacity, at least for the moment, to evaluate events and what our response should be and how we should think about them with reason, with rationality. 
Now, maybe that's a good thing sometimes not to be, we're not machines. We don't always just evaluate things through rationality. We are emotional beings and we can't avoid and probably shouldn't avoid interacting with the world with emotions. Emotions are important. Anger and rage and empathy and compassion. All of these emotions are not to be devalued. I don't, I'm not saying any of this to suggest that there's anything wrong with reacting emotionally to events where we're emotional beings. That's a part of our makeup for a reason. It's just that we ought to be aware of what the reaction is when our brains are flooded with high emotions, when our emotions are part of a collective reaction and therefore even more intense, given that we're social and political animals and we're tribal and we feed on one another's emotions. And so the more we all feel intense emotions, collectively the emotions intensify. It's important to realize what that means for our reasoning ability, which is our ability or our willingness even to think about things rationally and through reason as opposed to these emotions diminish. We're in a diminished state of reason when we react to things emotionally. And that's why whenever events like this happen, you can go through every single event that you might want to compare a new war to. Look at 9-11, for example. In the days after 9-11, we were all in lockstep about various ideas and emotions and reactions that a month later, two months later, a year later, 20 years later, many of us who embrace those emotions of the time have come to reevaluate and regard as misguided. There's no question that a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, we're going to be thinking about these events differently than we're able to think about them right now. And I just think it's important to realize that about ourselves, that we are in a state of intense passion and intense emotion and therefore a reduced capacity to think through things in a deliberative way, in a way that won't be true once we have a little bit more emotional distance. The other, and I think more important thing to realize about how we react to war and the intensity of the emotions it provokes is that, that emotions by their very nature are very susceptible to manipulation. All power centers know how to manipulate and control emotions. They use fear, they use anger, they use revenge, they use uh, a sense of righteous justice to, to, to move people. Governments have been studying this for a long time. And it, it, we are more easily manipulated in terms of how we react to things, how we think about things, who we trust, who we don't trust when we're in a state of high emotions because of the ease with which emotions can be trifled with, can be controlled. And it's not just governments that know how to do that. Obviously, media corporations think a lot about that. Social media companies and technology companies think a lot about that. A central prong of the strategy of those corporations is to use your emotions to keep you engaged with whatever they're offering, to make sure that your level of anger and rage and righteousness and interest are, are as high as possible. These are all things that many, many large institutions are thinking about right at this moment, consciously or otherwise with good or bad or neutral intentions about how they can play on these emotions that we all have in order to manipulate what we're doing and what we're thinking for their own ends. And I think we ought to be very very conscious of that also. Now, the other important component that I think we need to be very aware of, and I alluded to this already, is the fact that we are tribal creatures. We evolved as part of a tribe. We had to rely on our tribal membership in order to survive for millennia. It's embedded in our DNA and how we evolved it's one of the reasons, for example, that the threat of ostracization or stigma or social scorn and exclusion is so powerful because naturally we, we fear that. We fear being an outcast because of how we've evolved. Being an outcast from your tribe 5,000 years ago meant certain death. And even until very recently, it was very difficult to survive unless you were welcomed into a member of a community or a member of a tribe. This tribal instinct that we have is very potent. And obviously war is by, by definition a conflict between various tribes. 
and our tribal instincts are at its highest whenever there's an outbreak of war. And very similar to the intensity of emotion, tribal instinct, tribal identity, tribal membership in all kinds of ways plays a major role in how we view various events and how we are controlled and manipulated and, 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 and conditioned to think about these events. And I think there's a lot of that going on. And you may think that those are all good things. We should be angry. We should be rageful toward Russia. We should hate Vladimir Putin. We should want revenge on Russia. We should do everything possible to protect the innocent people of Ukraine. You may think that those are all valid emotions. All I'm suggesting is that the more self-consciousness we have about how our human psyche and our constitution determines and drives and shapes our reaction, the better we're able to understand our own reaction, the, the more, more uh, resistant we become to the ability of other external forces or institutions to manipulate how we're reacting. Now, one of the things that is clearly happening, clearly happening, first in Washington, but then throughout the country and then into the broader uh, international community that identifies with the West is there is a homogeneity of opinion. There is a unified consensus about how to understand this war. If you go and look at what Marco Rubio is saying about this war, it is exactly the same as what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is saying. If you look at what Nancy Pelosi is saying, it is exactly the same as what Lindsey Graham is saying. There's no left-right division, practically, when it comes to how we see this war. There's obviously an attempt for each side to blame the other to gain partisan advantage. The right is claiming that this war is happening because Biden was insufficiently confrontational with Putin. Liberals are claiming that this is all happening because Republicans are on the side of Russia. I'm not saying there's not an attempt to concoct divisions for partisan gain. That always happens. But the reality of how people are actually understanding this is very easily recognizable. It's a consensus, a unified consensus. Again, leaving aside the question of whether this is correct or incorrect or accurate or inaccurate. But the unified consensus and elite Amer American political and media discourse is very clear. The war is the fault, if not entirely, overwhelmingly, of a single villain, as is typically the case, a madman, a dictator, a deranged and hateful and maniacal and genocidal war criminal, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia. It's all his fault. It's an act of extreme evil and immorality, what it is that he's doing in Ukraine. And nobody else deserves any of the responsibility or blame. That if you were to suggest that the blame might be more appropriately divvied up among various parties, or if you question whether, in fact, that narrative is correct, it you will be immediately obliterated as disloyal to the United States, as a Kremlin agent. And this is not new. We've seen this many times before in the wake of 9-11. Anyone who questioned the George Bush, Dick Cheney policy of the war on terror and the various wars it included was accused of being on the side of Al-Qaeda, was accused of being a fifth columnist or somebody lacking patriotism. This was, I mean, this was, common. I mean, George Bush, in one of his first speeches before the joint session of Congress in October, less than a month after the September 11th attack, famously announced to the world the binary framework that he believed was appropriate, which is you're either with us or you're with the terrorists, meaning you either support everything we're doing, in which case you're with us. You don't just say that you're with us, but you take action in, in, in to support what we're doing. And the only other alternative is you're with the terrorists. That was the binary framework that George Bush and his neocon speechwriters like David Frum and advisors and Dick Cheney deliberately cultivated. And obviously we see that same framework being deliberately cultivated now, this binary. You either support President Biden and his policies 
and affirm with all of your heart, with all of your might in an unquestioning way, the narrative that is the consensus of American elites, both right and left that I just articulated, that's one option. There's only one other option. It's binary. You're on the side of Russia. You're a traitor, you're treasonous to the United States and you are a Kremlin asset or a Kremlin agent or a useful idiot. You're either with us or you're with the Russians. That is the framework that has again been imposed as a framework that we've seen so many times throughout American history to quash dissent, to delegitimize dissenters, to destroy the reputation of anyone seeking to question the prevailing narrative. And most importantly of all, to create a climate where you know, you know, that if you want to publicly express any doubt, even if you want to just raise concerns or questions about what you're being told, you must affirm, you know what the punishment will be. It's the social scorn and ostracization that I referenced earlier that we all instinctively avoid because of how we're made up. You will be mauled widely at the slightest sign of dissent. Now, as I said, I don't think that's going to be the case in two weeks or two months, or two years. We often are given license to reevaluate what we're told we're supposed to think at the beginning. But because of the emotions and the, and the tribalism that prevail and the lockstep unity, there's almost no space at the moment to do anything but affirm those narratives, those pieties and those orthodoxies, that moral script that I'm sure many of you agree with, which is absolutely your right. But nonetheless, it should be in all of our interest that we have space for other people to question what it is that is the consensus. We've seen so many times, so many times in so many wars, in the pandemic, in every civil liberties crisis where the consensus is wrong, either in whole or in part, even if you're somebody who agrees in large part or entirely with that moral binary framework that I described, you still have an interest in allowing others who see things a little bit differently or who want to ask questions designed to determine the validity of that argument and the response of the United States to all of this. It's still in your interest to allow people to be able to do that without being demonized or punished or cast out. But that is exactly what's happening. I just want to take a look a little bit at some of the critical evidence about how quickly this toxic climate that's intolerant of any dissent has arisen. So you can see how potent it is. So here is a tweet from Michael McFall, who was the ambassador to Russia during the Obama administration and is a longtime hawk when it comes to how the United States should deal with Putin. He's been critical of almost every administration for being insufficiently confrontational toward Putin. He was a, an aggressive Russia gator accusing Trump of being in bed with Kremlin. That's his entire profile. And just to give you a sense for how far he's going, here is his tweet from this morning in which he demands that media outlets not air any dissent at all. This is what he said, quote, Please don't give Putin propagandists a platform on your media platforms. There is a time and place for hearing two sides of an issue. This tragic moment in European history is not one of them. Do not give false equivalency to voices of evil and voices of good. He's demanding that the media only show one side of the story, that the media just shove down your throat the script that I referenced earlier that is the united lockstep consensus of American political and 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 media elites and not even allow anyone to be heard who questions it on the grounds that anyone questioning it is a voice of evil challenging the voice of good that anybody who questions the western narrative is a putin propagandist and that there's just no two sides to this issue there's just one side you're either with us or you're with the terrorists and media outlets should exclude from their discourse any questioning or dissent. You should never want this to happen, ever. If it's really true that Ambassador McFall has 
acquired for himself the indisputable absolute good. And anyone who disagrees with him is clearly evil. There's no two sides of the story. That's all the more reason to allow that other side to be heard so that it can be obliterated, so that it can be demonstrated to be obviously wrong, obviously immoral. When people start calling, people of high influence start calling for the media to self-censor, to not allow the other side of the story, to not even allow you to hear what Russian officials are saying about the war and why they started it. If, if you're not even allowed to hear that, if you're not allowed to hear anybody questioning Joe Biden or the policies of the Biden administration or to suggest that it played a role in where we are and how we might want be able to change that posture to avoid a worse war in the future or ongoing war. If you're at the point where we're at the point where people are calling the media outlets to not allow any of that to be aired, we are already in a very dangerous moment. There was an episode after 9-11, I think a lot of people have forgotten in part because it wasn't very well publicized. And because in the wake of 9-11, there was so much other shock and trauma going on that a lot of things that were important got overlooked where the U.S. government instructed network news outlets, which at the time, 2001, were obviously the dominant outlets, ABC, NBC, CBS, not to air any footage of interviews with Osama bin Laden, either past interviews where he talked about his grievances with the United States or sp current interviews where he explained why what the rationale was behind 9-11. They didn't want... Americans to hear what Al Qaeda was saying, that their grievances were U.S. occupation of Saudi Arabia, a place that Muslims had always regarded as sacred, or that U.S. sanctions regimes in Iraq had killed 500,000 children, or that the U.S. was supporting Israel against Palestinians. They didn't want Americans to even hear that. Again, it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, because they wanted to be able to feed their own narrative to the American people without being challenged. And they instructed media outlets, just like Ambassador McFall was doing, not even to show the other side of the story. And those outlets obeyed. There were interviews with Osama bin Laden in October and November and December of 20 uh, of 2001 by Al Jazeera, by other journalists in the region. And these networks suppressed it. So Americans never heard those grievances. And so all we heard instead from our political leaders was that the reason Al Qaeda had attacked us wasn't because they were angry at our involvement militarily in their region with the CIA had long called blowback, but it was because they hated us for our freedoms. Bin Laden was saying, no, that what you're being told about why this attack happened is not true, but no Americans heard it because the government instructed media outlets not to air it. And those governments obeyed the excuse that the government concocted at the time was that they said that they were concerned that if you aired a bin Laden interview or an excerpt of a bin Laden interview, he may embed within what he's saying secret code that is designed to communicate to dormant sleeper cells in the United States an instruction to activate and to attack. A completely absurd rationale, but one that the networks accepted. So when this climate starts to emerge where we're being told we shouldn't and can't hear any side of the story other than the one that the government and the media have united to instruct us we have to embrace. Even if you agree with that message, this should be very disturbing to you. It is to me. Now, let me show you what is happening to people who are questioning this prevailing narrative. It's important that heretics be found, that tra traitors be found, it's, it, because People, what they want to do is they, they look for them to hold up as an example. They say, oh, look, we found somebody here who is questioning what we're saying. This person is a traitor. And they want to direct intense hatred and rage toward anyone questioning their narrative as a signal to other people about what will happen to them if they do the same. It's an enforcement mechanism. It's like monarchs who take protesters or underground resistance activist and behead them and put the head on a pike outside the castle as a message to everybody else about what will happen if they resist 
the rule of the monarch. It's the same dynamic. It's 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 designed to terrorize you out of descent. So here is Tulsi Gabbard, who, as most of you probably know, was a three-term Democratic congresswoman from Hawaii. She, in 2016, was the vice chair of the Democratic National Committee, but resigned in protest over what she said was cheating by the DNC on behalf of Hillary Clinton, something we know as a result of WikiLeaks and those publications, in fact, took place. And she supported Bernie Sanders in 2016. She endorsed the most left-wing candidate that was running, Bernie Sanders. And then in 2020, she ran for president. And when she dropped out of the race, she endorsed Joe Biden over Donald Trump. So she supported Sanders in 2016, Biden over Trump in 2020. She herself is a lifelong Democrat representing the Democratic Party from Hawaii. She's also a lifelong member of the U.S. military. She's currently, I believe, a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves. And I know for a fact that a lot of her time is still occupied by her work for the U.S. military. She's a combat veteran. She served, she volunteered to fight in Iraq. I believe she did two or three tours of duty. And she has her own views as a patriot, an American patriot, about what is the best foreign policy for the United States in terms of Russia, which you should want every citizen, especially ones with experience in foreign policy, to have the right to express. And her view has been consistent over the last two years, which is that the United States should not be pursuing a policy of confrontation with Moscow. She supported President Trump and and his supporters in that view that confrontation between the United States and Russia is the most dangerous thing that can happen because they're the two most nuclear armed powers on the planet. And that we should, instead of pursuing a path of confrontation, should be pursuing a path of cooperation and finding ways to resolve our problems, not militarily, but diplomatically. And when it comes to Ukraine, her message has been consistent, which is that Russia has a genuine fear of being encircled by NATO and that in particular has an acute fear, not just Vladimir Putin, but all Russian leaders of what will happen if NATO is placed in Ukraine or if Ukraine is placed in NATO. All you have to do is look at 20th century history or a map to see why Ukraine is so critical to Russia. It's the place where they were twice attacked by Germany in the 20th century and lost tens of millions of people in those two wars. Ukraine has been a a critical spot of vulnerability for Russia, not in the distant, distant past, but in the 20th century. And so putting NATO in Ukraine on the Russian border, as already other bordering states are already their promised membership in NATO or have been given it, is something whether you think it's right or wrong, is a genuine fear on the part of all Russians, not just Vladimir Putin and not even people who support Putin, but even Russian liberals, opponents of Putin, believe that putting Ukraine in NATO or threatening to put Ukraine in NATO is incredibly provocative and dangerous for Russia, legitimately so. That is the perception, not of Vladimir Putin, but of... But of... uh, Russia in general. And so her argument has been very clear from for a long time. We should stop threatening Russia that we're going to put Ukraine in NATO. And even though everybody knows that we're not going to put Ukraine in NATO, the United States refuses to say it. That's been Russia's demand for a long time. And Tulsi Gabbard's argument is we should give that guarantee to Russia, we should give the guarantee that we're going to neutralize NATO. They're not going to be part of uh, uh, that. We should we're going to neutralize Ukraine. They're not going to be part of NATO or the EU. They're not going to be under Russia's command or influence. They're going to be a neutral state because that will give the assurances to Russia that they're not being threatened and that can avert war. That's been her consistent message for years. And she's still saying it. So early this morning, as war broke out, She went on Twitter and expressed that view. She said, this war and suffering could have been easily, could could have easily been avoided 
if the Biden administration and NATO had simply acknowledged Russia's legitimate security concerns regarding Ukraine's becoming a member of NATO, which would mean U.S. NATO forces right on Russia's border. You don't have to agree with that if you don't want. But to say that this is some kind of insane or irrational or traitorous thought is preposterous. I could spend the next four or five hours showing you leading members of the U.S. military and the CIA saying exactly this. Members, I could I could show you people on the left like Noam Chomsky and and Robert and, and, and uh, Robert Cohen and many other people who have been leading leftist foreign policy and Russia commentators and people on the right and everybody in between and members of the U.S. military who all say the same thing. That Russia not only has a genuine but a legitimate fear of what will happen if NATO exists in Ukraine. And that the expansion of NATO over the last 15 to 20 years has given Russia the perception that they're being encircled in a way that makes them feel very insecure. So all she's saying is like, look, the reason this war happened is important and we should think about it precisely because maybe there's still a way now to stop it. Maybe if we get Ukraine to tell Russia they won't seek NATO membership. And if the U.S. and NATO say we don't intend to put Ukraine in NATO, perhaps that's a way we can take what is now a horrific military conflict and turn it into the diplomatic realm. Again, agree with it or not, it is an eminently reasonable position that finds widespread support, not in Moscow, but in the highest levels of United States scholarship and academia and military and intelligence community salons. You can find people saying the same thing. That's where she got it from. She's part of that world. Let's look at how people reacted to Tulsi Gabbard saying that. I don't mean like random Twitter trolls. I mean, people with influential positions. Here is Fred Wellman, who is one of the leading members of the Lincoln Project the beloved Lincoln project that liberals have enriched because they're former Republicans who say they're against Trump. He responded, you need to throw your army uniform out. You fucking traitor pretty much direct and to the point. Just pulling her a traitor. Somebody risked her life to fight for the United States in a war that a lot of people, including myself think was a gigantic mistake and an, and a, an act of immorality. But she has been somebody who went and did that. And he's calling her a traitor and telling her to throw her fucking uniform out simply because of her belief that the United States should have a position that Ukraine will be neutral in order to appease or placate Russia's fears. Here is Rachel Vindman, who I guess is notable because her husband became a liberal media hero by blowing the whistle on Donald Trump and causing his first impeachment over Ukraine, who also echoed the same thing. You are a fucking traitor. Do you understand they're calling Tulsi Gabbard a traitor for the slightest dissent? Here is Matt Zeller, who was in the military and the CIA, who told her, you are a traitor and a coward. Resign your commission and go home to your handlers in Moscow. She's not just a traitor and somehow she's a coward. How is Tulsi Gabbard, who volunteered to go fight in Iraq, a coward? Call her whatever else you want, but how is she a coward? And this has been a theme against Tulsi Gabbard for years. In 2020, Hillary Clinton suggested that Tulsi Gabbard's candidacy, the purpose of it, was to serve Kremlin's the Kremlin's interests. And of course, when she went and endorsed Joe Biden and didn't run as a third-party candidate, as Democrats were claiming she intended to do, they never went back and apologized. They just call anybody that they want, an asset of the Kremlin, a coward, a traitor, people who have handlers in Moscow. This is the climate from the slightest ascent. This is a tweet from Lawrence Tribe, who has long, for decades, been considered if not the most preeminent liberal constitutional law scholar, one of the leading constitutional law scholars in the, in the country. He's on the uh, faculty of Harvard Law School. He has been a top, top constitutional lawyer for decades. And he went on Twitter three days ago 
And this is what he said. One of the most unhinged, deranged, insane, authoritarian, despotic statements I've ever seen published by a Harvard Law School professor. Listen to what he wrote. Quote, led by Fox News Channel's Tucker Carlson, the GOP's Trump wing appears to be throwing its weight behind Putin. You're either with us or you're with the terrorists. If Putin opts to wage war on our ally Ukraine, such, quote, aid and comfort to a, quote, enemy would appear to become, quote, treason, as defined by Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution. He's not just using traitor colloquially as a social media insult. He is, on purpose, trying to lead people to believe that anyone who goes on Fox News and in some way says something, they're not sending arms to Russia they're not going to fight for Russia. They're not sending money to Russia. They're expressing their opinion as an American citizen about U.S. policy that they not just could be, but likely are guilty of the highest and gravest crime in the United States criminal code, which is treason, punishable by death. Look at how that tweet viralized. 5,000 retweets, almost 20,000 likes. He did end up deleting it without comment after he let it spread all over the internet. But He's saying that if you even express these views, the same one Tulsi Gabbard expressed, that you should be imprisoned as a traitor to your country because of the views that you formulated as an American citizen. Here is John Pavowitz, who is a fiction writer, who said Tucker Carlson needs to be held accountable. He said that this morning. He didn't say how Tucker Carlson should be held accountable. What does that mean to hold a cable host accountable? Again, Tucker Carlson hasn't fought for the Russian army, hasn't sent money to Russia or arms to Russia. He's just expressing his views on what the U.S. government policy should be toward Ukraine and Russia, which he has obviously every right to do under the Constitution they're supposedly so enamored of. But he wants them held accountable. Now, as I said, this is very redolent of the climate that emerged after 9-11, except The sides are reversed. After 9-11, it was very common on the American right to accuse anybody questioning George Bush and Dick Cheney's policies of being a traitor. And a lot of conservatives I know, including prominent media ones, have said that they regret that that was a gigantic mistake, not just supporting those policies, but creating this climate. But one of the most notorious statements along those lines came from Andrew Sullivan, who wrote in the Times of London on September 16, 2001, so just less than a week after 9-11, quote, the middle part of the United States, the great red zone that voted for Bush is clearly ready for war. But the decadent left in its enclaves on the coast is not, and may well, is not dead, and may well mount a fifth column. Fifth column is a historical term for treason, traitors, within your own society. Now, Andrew has apologized countless times for what he said, acknowledging how, how toxic and repressive and, and, and misguided it was. But this is exactly what is the prevailing sentiment now. I just showed you what, he, what Andrew Sullivan said here about the decadent left and its enclaves on the coasts who don't support George Bush and Dick Cheney being traitors is exactly what people are saying about anyone who questions the current U S government narrative about what should be done with Ukraine and Russia. Now I referenced earlier, the fact that Tulsi Gabbard's view is one that you can find support for throughout academia, but also military leaders like Tulsi Gabbard and intelligence operatives. I just want to show you a couple of examples because I think it's really worth hearing from people who have a different view. You turn on TV and all you're going to hear is everything is Putin's fault. We're the innocent victims. There's nothing we could have done to stop this. This is because Putin's a madman. So I really think it's worth just hearing, even if you don't agree with it, the other side, in part so your mind is open to that, try and use reason and not emotion, but also because this climate that has been created, you see, suggests that anyone who has that view is a Kremlin agent. So listen to members of the military, the U.S. military have devoted their lives to defending the United States and listen to their analysis of what happened with Russia and Ukraine in the United States. Here 
is Colonel Douglas McGregor, who was interviewed by Tucker Carlson last night. I think it's really worth listening to a part of what he says in his analysis. Yeah. But I'm also very concerned that we find a way to avoid a conflict with Russia. And the first thing we've got to do is acknowledge that Putin's basic point, not just his point, the Russian government's point, which they've made for 25 years, is valid. They don't want U.S. forces and missiles and NATO troops immediately across the border in eastern Ukraine. Absolutely. We didn't want them in Cuba. He doesn't want them in eastern Ukraine. We should acknowledge that. Stop pretending that's a non-issue. It is a major issue for them. Let's acknowledge it. And let's get down to business and then tell them, fine, our, our concern at this point is we don't want you to proceed west towards the Polish border over the Dnieper River in Ukraine. In other words, you're going to go into eastern Ukraine. That's pretty obvious. That's what the troop disposition suggests. We understand it. We would prefer not. But ultimately, we do understand your point. We acknowledge it. We are ready to neutralize Ukraine. Ukraine doesn't have to be in NATO. Neither does Georgia. And we can discuss those terms of neutrality. Now, if you will, if you will accept those terms, then let's talk about the other things that are important. The INF Treaty, making that relevant again. What about uh, where troops are near borders and when they're not near borders and how they'll exercise? We can sort through all of that. We have refused to do this. And because we've refused it, we're going to watch as 130, 140,000 troops go into eastern Ukraine in the next few days. And there's not a damn thing. We Why is that even a controversial point? Why can't you say that? He's talking as a military leader who has dealt with Russia for decades. And he's obviously looking at it through the prism of the United States and how the U.S. military planners would think. Remember, we almost went to, we almost started a nuclear war with Russia over what they were doing in Cuba because we regarded what Russia was doing in Cuba as such a threat to the United States. They didn't invade the United States, but they had, were, were planning on putting nuclear missiles at the request of the Castro government close to our borders. And that was completely, we were willing to risk a nuclear war to stop that. We've always had the view that what happens in countries with proximity to us in Latin America with the Monroe Doctrine is of vital interest to us, but not to any other country. That's been the official position of the United States government for 230 years. And obviously, everyone knows that if China or Russia created a new military alliance and invited Mexico or Canada or a Caribbean nation to join and at the same time flooded those countries with lethal arms, lethal offensive arms to fight against us, as we've been doing with Ukraine, we wouldn't just say, oh, well, I guess those countries have the sovereign right to do that. We would, of course, react as a, as if that were a grave threat to our national security, which it would be. And so all he's doing is saying the Russians see the situation in Ukraine exactly the way that we as military leaders in the United States would see the similar thing, something similar happening on the border of our country. That's all he's doing is applying a pragmatic, realist view to this conflict. Exactly what Tulsi Gabbard said. Is he also a traitor and a coward? Because that's how he sees it. Here is another lifelong member of the military, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel L. Uh, Davis. I think uh, we have that wrong on the screen. It's Daniel L. Davis, um, who spoke with the show Rising uh, which is the the show uh, of the Hill this morning about his analysis of the conflict and listen to what he said and you'll note how striking it is and its similarity between what we just heard and what Tulsi Gabbard and Tucker Carlson have been saying also while being called traitors for saying it. All the bloodshed here is 100% on the shoulders of Vladimir Putin and nobody else. There, this does not have to happen. But with that saying, he has been signaling for 15 years that that uh, you, NATO uh, advancement to his border through Ukraine is a red line. And he has shown twice in 2008 and 2014 that he is willing to use force to limit it. As, as recently as December, uh, Putin again said, hey, y'all aren't listening to me. I am deadly serious about this red line on Ukraine. And then he signaled again with this massive buildup of forces 
which we just seem to want to ignore. We don't like it. We don't want to be told we can't do anything. What we should have done and what even still is still possible in this now aftermath is that we should have said, hey, Ukraine's never coming in NATO. This, this is not something that the, the alliance needs. They'll never qualify. So why should we say that this door is open when all that's going to do is get Ukraine sucked into a war? Because Putin was very clear on that. We made certain that we everybody understood that we, that they're not coming in NATO because every NATO nation has said we're not going to fight Russia on your behalf. Now, if you're not going to fight them, then why not do the one thing that might have precluded war and say the door is closed so that we take off the table the Putin's red line? And then this may not have happened at all, but it did. And now that we've left the the uh, the Ukrainians on their own, they're fighting this on their own. Nobody's coming to their aid. And so I think that they need to now take the this, you know, bull by the horns and say, hey, we got to have to make some hard choices here. And that is to, if you declare in uh, neutrality right now, if you say we're not going to join NATO anymore, that's going to be a, a humiliating situation. But it could. Is Lieutenant Colonel Davis like Colonel Colonel McGregor and Tulsi Gabbard? Or, is he also a traitor to the United States, a coward, an agent of the Kremlin because of that pragmatic analysis? He, he He's trying to find ways to stop this war. And he's saying if if everyone knows that Ukraine won't really ever be put into NATO because NATO members aren't going to go and risk war with Russia to defend Ukraine. Why not just say that? Or why not get Ukraine to say it? Maybe it's a imperfect solution, but it's certainly better than watching Ukrainian cities being bombed. And it's something we could have done all along, but refused to do it. Why can't you say this when it is something that has been recognized for very long now? Um, there's another aspect to all of this that I think um, is really important. And I'm, I'm going to get to the whole question of what has happened over the last five years with Russiagate and Donald Trump and the, the climate that created out of that. I talked last night on Fox News with Laura Ingram about how ratcheting up tensions with Russia over the last five years to play games, partisan games with Russiagate and how making it basically – inherently suspicious of not criminal to even meet with Russian diplomats was an incredibly reckless thing to do. And it's not something that I'm saying now I spent five years denouncing Russiagate, not just because it lacked evidence, but because of how dangerous it was. So I'm going to get to that as well as the obvious irony that the media consensus was that Trump was the puppet of Putin controlled by and subservient to him. And yet it wasn't under Trump, but Obama when Russia annexed, Crimea and it was under George Bush and not Trump when Russia invaded Georgia and it's now under Biden and not Trump when Russia invaded Ukraine. It's incredibly bizarre, isn't it? That the the weak controlled subservient president to the Kremlin was the one who never allowed Russia to invade parts of Ukraine or other of their neighbors and declare those now part of Russia or otherwise independent. You would think that would lead to a reevaluation of that. I'm going to get to that because I think it's an extremely important part of the story. But the one thing I also want to point out is to listen now to the narrative that we're all required to affirm. You would think that Russia just kind of woke up one day and decided to attack Ukraine the way the United States just kind of woke up and decided to attack Iraq with the obvious difference that the United States went all the way on the other side of the world to attack Iraq, whereas Russia is attacking a country on their border. And that the United States is nothing but this kind of innocent, passive bystander, this like onlooker, just like wanting to defend Ukrainian democracy, this independent sovereign state. And the reality is completely different. The United States has been extremely involved actively involved in the internal governance of Ukraine since at least what some call the revolution and others call the coup in 2014 that installed a pro-EU, pro-Western leader. You obviously all remember the scandal of 
how Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, was paid $50,000 a month to sit on the board of Burisma Energy, despite him having no experience in or competence about any energy industry, much less Ukrainian energy. And everyone knows why he was paid that money. It was because the Ukrainians were desperate to get access and influence with Joe Biden. Why? Why were the Ukrainians so desperate to get access and influence with Joe Biden? It was because Joe Biden, as Obama's vice president, was essentially running Ukraine. He was picking and choosing which prosecutors should be fired or hired. And the United States essentially chose who the Ukrainian leader would be in 2014. Here is a tweet from Aaron Mate, who remembered that a video or audio from then senior U.S. official Victoria Nuland, who at the time was a senior Obama State Department official, now is a senior Biden State Department official, and then U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, were talking on the phone in a leaked uh, conversation where they basically just sat there openly choosing the Ukrainian government. They picked and chose who was going to be part of the Ukrainian government. That's how involved the U.S. has been. Listen to them do that. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tani Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Does that sound like an independent sovereign democracy that the United States has been keeping out of? Of course not. They were running Ukraine for the interests of the United States right on the Russian border. Is it hard to understand why... Russia considered that threatening, especially when the U.S. and political U.S. political media class were demanding that Russia be viewed increasingly as an enemy in order to undermine Donald Trump's presidency. Imagine if Russia were choosing the Mexican president or the Chinese were in Canada picking and choosing who their prosecutors were so involved that they were basically acting like a colonial power running Canada and Mexico right on our borders. It just takes a little rationality to understand why that's threatening to Russia, which isn't the same thing as saying Russia was justified in invading Ukraine. It's critical, though, to be given the space to understand what role the United States played so that we can also figure out what not to do in the future to worsen this war, but instead bring it to an end. Now, just to go back to this point about Ukraine and NATO, the media until yesterday, when the war started, it became taboo to talk about it was very open about the fact that everyone knew exactly what Putin's primary grievance was, which was the ongoing explicit explicit threat to put Ukraine in NATO. And his demand to avoid war was very simple. Promise that Ukraine will not go into NATO. Take Ukraine off the track. Here from The Guardian, um, I believe this is from uh, last week, The headline reads, U.S. holds firm on Ukraine's right to join NATO in its response to Russian demand. U.S. officials offer also offer to negotiate on European security with Moscow, but won't move on the most contentious issue. The U.S. just said, no, we're not going to promise you that Ukraine won't go into NATO. If we want to put Ukraine in NATO, we're going to put them in NATO. And we're not going to even give this to you as a way of avoiding war. Quote, the U.S. has presented its written response to Russian demands on Ukraine, but made clear that it did not change Washington's support for Ukraine's right to pursue NATO membership, the most contentious issue, the most contentious issue in relations with Moscow. This reply, which was delivered to the Russian foreign minister by the U.S. ambassador to Moscow, John Sullivan, repeats the U.S. offer to negotiate with Russia over some aspects of European security, but the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, said the issue of eventual Ukrainian membership of the alliance was one of principle. Blinken was speaking hours after his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, threatened, quote, retaliatory measures if the U.S. response did not satisfy the Kremlin. Without going into the specifics of the document, I can tell you that it reiterates what we said publicly for many weeks and in a sense for many, many years, that we will uphold the principle of NATO's open door, Blinken said, adding, this is no change. There will be no change. Now, 
I know the, the date on that Guardian article is incorrect. I believe it's from last week. I think it's February 16th. But it makes clear what until yesterday everyone knew, but now is not allowed to say, which is that the U.S. did have a way to avoid this war, or at least a plausible way. Maybe Putin would have attacked anyway. But the U.S. did not do everything it could have to avoid this war. It could have simply said, we're not going to put NATO right onto the most sensitive area of your border. The history of the breakup of the Soviet Union, when Nikhil Gorbachev and George Bush and Ronald Reagan were negotiating, especially Bush and Gorbachev, was that the Soviet Union was petrified of the reunification of Germany for obvious reasons. As I said earlier, that's a country that twice attacked Russia to devastating effect in the 20th century. They were petrified about the reunification of Germany, East Germany melding into West Germany and becoming a reunified Germany. And the promise that was made to Russia in exchange, to Gorbachev, in exchange for them agreeing to reunification was that we will never move NATO one inch east beyond East Germany. That's what they were so afraid of. They had this ally in East Germany, part of the Warsaw Pact, that was now about to become NATO, which means NATO was now going to move east, closer to the Russian border with Germany, the most terrifying country to Russia. And in order to induce their acquiescence to that, the promise was made, we will never move NATO one inch beyond the east. And then very quickly through the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the Obama administration, NATO continued to expand, including up to former Soviet republics right on to the Russian border. Exactly what the Russians always made so clear was their overarching fear. And that U.S. intelligence and military officials repeatedly said was a legitimate fear, not an irrational one. So if this war is the most devastating war since Hitler, more devastating than what the U.S. did in Vietnam and Iraq and so many other places, if that's what you believe. Why didn't we do everything we could to, to avert it? Why didn't we just give that concession that Ukraine would never be a NATO in order to avert this horrific war? Now, you can say, look, we're the United States. We don't negotiate. We don't make concessions, which, OK, is fine. But certainly it's a reasonable view to think we should. And people like Tulsi Gabbard and Tucker Carlson and members of the U.S. military who believe we should have certainly shouldn't be demonized as traitors or cowards or Kremlin agents for thinking that kind of diplomacy was worthwhile. Now, I do want to, as I said, spend a little bit of time talking about the effects of the last five years. When Donald Trump ran for president in 2016, he was very clear that one of his main goals was to improve relations with Russia. He was saying, why do we want to risk a war with Russia over Syria? Why is it worth it to the United States to try and change the government of Syria, overthrow the regime of Bashar al-Assad, an important Russian ally? We should work with the Russians and the Syrians to fight against common enemies, namely ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which were enemies of Russia, enemies of Assad, presumably enemies of the United States. Instead, the CIA was on the same side as Al-Qaeda in Syria trying to overthrow Assad. And Trump was questioning that and saying, why, why are we arming Al-Qaeda or fighting on the same side as Al-Qaeda to change the government of Syria? Why is that in our interest? We should get along with Russia given that they're a major nuclear power. Why would we want to risk war with Russia over Ukraine? And as a result, this is what led to this narrative that Trump was a Kremlin agent. This goes back to 2016, this idea that if you want better relations with Putin and the Kremlin and Moscow, it means that you're a Kremlin agent. And starting in mid-2016, the Clinton campaign's primary attack on Trump was that he was in bed with the Kremlin and that the Kremlin had something over Trump that we was very mysterious and we didn't know what it was, but it was probably some kind of blackmail that meant that Putin controlled everything that Trump did. 
And as a result, in Washington, it became virtually a crime to even talk to Russians. And it was so clear how reckless and dangerous that was, given that we're talking about the two largest super nuclear armed powers on, on the planet. Of course, you don't want to create a climate where they can't speak it. That's exactly what was done. Now, here is an article by Robert Wright, who is a longtime foreign policy analyst that he published on his substack called Non-Zero in February 22, where he asked in the headline, why Biden didn't negotiate seriously with Putin. And he examines the climate that got created between the United States and Russia, but even more importantly, the longstanding recognition by leaders of the CIA and the highest levels of the U.S. military that the idea that it would be threatening for NATO to expand into up to the Russian border is not something Putin invented out of insanity, but is something that all Russians believe genuinely and in their view, legitimately. Just listen to part of this article. He's quoting the, the uh, current CIA director, William Burns, who back in 2008 said, quote, not everyone would see the Ukraine crisis. This is Robert Wright speaking. Not everyone would see the Ukraine crisis as a perplexing product of Putin's eccentricities. Consider the current CIA director, William Burns. So he's saying what we're supposed to believe now is that Putin is this madman. He's lost touch with his capacity to reason. He's gone insane. He's like a homicidal tyrant. Um, and that's He's saying that that's not something that makes a lot of sense. You got to move the camera. And he's saying, look at what the current CIA director, William Burns, said. Back in 2008, the year that George W. Bush faithfully badgered reluctant European leaders into pledging future NATO membership to Ukraine, Burns, the CIA director now under, under Biden, sent a memo to then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice that included this warning. This is what the current CIA director told Condoleezza Rice back in 2008 about threatening to put Ukraine in NATO, which is what Tulsi Gabbard and everyone else who's being called a traitor is now saying. Listen to what Burns said back in 2008. Quote, Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite, not just Putin. In more than two and a half years of conversations with key Russian players, from knuckle dragglers in the dark recesses of the Kremlin to Putin's sharpest liberal critics, I have yet to find anyone who view Ukraine and NATO as anything other than a direct challenge to Russian interests. Burns added that it was, quote, hard to overstate their strategic consequences of offering Ukraine, Ukraine NATO membership, a move that he predicted would, quote, create fertile soil for Russian meddling in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. Now, could he have been more prescient? He was saying, if we trifle with this dangerous game of putting bordering countries into NATO, and especially Ukraine, at some point, that's going to provoke Russia into interfering in Crimea and East Eastern Ukraine. Exactly what has happened. But if you point out what the current CIA director was saying and warning 14 years ago about the dangers of NATO expansion, you get called a traitor, as we just saw with Tulsi Gabbard and those members of the military and Tucker Carlson. Now, just to reinforce the point I made earlier about how heavily Biden has been involved in Ukraine, right on the Russian border, here from USA Today on October 3rd, 2019, is an explainer that Quote, Biden and his allies pushed out Ukrainian prosecutor because he didn't pursue corruption cases. As I was indicating, this is how much we were micromanaging, not just macromanaging Ukrainian politics, that Biden was not just selecting with Victoria Nuland, who would run Ukraine, but was on the level of demanding which prosecutors should be moved around. And this was the United States government ruling Ukraine as a colony right on the Russian border. That is something that needs to be factored in to the calculus. Now let's look at the tensions that were created by Russiagate. For sure you remember this. It was the Washington Post, March 1st, 2017, a headline, Jeff Sessions, who was 
Trump's attorney general. At the time, he was a U.S. senator on various armed services and intelligence communities, met with the Russian envoy twice last year, encounters he later did not disclose. Do you see how they were turning what had always been benign and even desirable meetings between leading U.S. politicians and Russian officials into something nefarious? This is what Russiagate was about, was taking conversations that you want to happen at the highest levels of the American and Russian government and turning them into some form of treason or collusion or criminality. Michael Flynn, who, like all those other people now being accused of being a traitor, was criminally prosecuted for it. Just weeks before he was about to become the national security advisor, he did what you would want any national security advisor in a transition to do. He called his Russian counterpart, the uh, the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kip, uh, Ser Kislyak, and talked to him about what the future of U.S.-Russian relations would be. The FBI went and interrogated him about it. They prosecuted him because they claimed that he didn't remember everything he said or that he covered up the fact that they discussed sanctions. And for years, this is the New York Times in 2020, they treated it as though it was some sort of crime. That was why Russiagate was so dangerous. It severed the idea that we can pursue better relations with Russia, a central campaign pledge of Donald Trump, because it turned this relationship between Trump officials and Russian officials into actual criminality and proof of treason. Remember when Trump met with Vladimir Putin in Helsinki, John Brennan called it an act of treason, nothing short of treason. The hashtag treason summit trended on Twitter for days. That was the climate that got created is that the U.S. and the Russians should have a relationship of acrimony and hostility and not cooperation. And as a result, we now have that. The, the U.S. turned into an adversary of Russia, and that made our behavior in expanding NATO and controlling Ukraine even more threatening to Russia. And we now have almost no diplomatic relations with Russia because of the six or five years that the Democratic Party and their media allies played this game, this dangerous, reckless game with Russia, all in order to undermine Trump's political interests for cheap partisan advantage. This whole insane conspiracy theory that the Russians had taken over the United States, were ruling the powers, the levers of power in American government through sexual and clandestine financial blackmail over the, all of this constant messaging, training an entire generation of Americans to view Russia as this grave threat. These are the fruits we're now seeing of it. Now, perhaps the biggest irony of all of this is that the thing that you're not allowed to say now, the biggest taboo of all, just go on Twitter and utter this and you'll see how you will immediately be labeled a traitor or a Kremlin agent if you say it. The single biggest taboo is the following. What happens in Ukraine is not really of interest to the United States, or at least not enough of an interest for the United States to become involved. Because it's not a vital interest to the United States. Why would it be? And no matter what you think of U.S. involvement in the Middle East for all those years, the wars and the interventions and the bombing and the coups, all of which I'm against, at least there was an actual resource in that region that was a vital interest to the United States, namely oil. How is Ukraine or what happens in Ukraine or to Ukraine of vital interest to the, United, to the United States? It is, though, a vital interest to a country. That country is called Russia for the reasons that I've just said. You can't say that now, but the most eloquent defender of that view for eight years, the view that Ukraine is not a vital interest to the United States but is to Russia, is named Barack Obama. Remember in 2012, he famously mocked Mitt Romney for suggesting that Russia was the number one geopolitical foe of Russia, of the United States. They released videos the Democratic Party did calling this an archaic view from the Cold War, pointing out how often we cooperate with Russia in so many areas of the world, which was true. The United States and Russia were cooperating as partners for all those years. 
But in 2016, this was the culmination of Obama's view because what had happened was members of both political parties, the pro-war establishment wing of Republicans and Democrats were demanding that Obama send lethal weapons to Ukraine. Flood, they wanted to flood Ukraine with lethal weapons to fight against Russia. And Obama was unwilling to do that. He resisted it for a year and a half. And in 2016, he sat down for a in-depth foreign policy interview with the neoconservative editor-in-chief of the Atlantic, Jeffrey Goldberg, who has long been one of America's most deceitful warmongers back in the day before the Iraq war. He was the one who peddled the, the, the incredibly destructive fiction that Saddam Hussein was in an alliance with Al-Qaeda, which obviously made Americans more willing to go to war with Iraq, thinking that Iraq was responsible for 9-11. He's been promoted ever since. He's now the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic. He was one of Obama's favorite journalists. So he's, Obama sat down with an interview for him, and, Ob- and, and Jeffrey Goldberg pressured him aggressively on why he was so unwilling to confront Putin. And it's really worth looking at what Obama said, because it's what you're not allowed to say now. Here's the headline from that interview, The Obama Doctrine from April 2016. The U.S. president talks through his hardest decisions about America's role in the world. Here's the part about Ukraine. Here's Jeffrey Goldberg writing, summarizing what Obama told him. Obama's theory here is simple. Ukraine is a core Russian interest, but not an American one. So Russia will be always able to maintain escalatory dominance there. The fact is that Ukraine, which is a non-NATO country, is going to be vulnerable to military domination by Russia, no matter what we do, said Obama. I asked Obama whether his position on Ukraine was realistic or fatalistic. This is how Obama responded, quote, I'm realistic. But as an example of where we have to be very clear about what our interests are and what we are willing to go to war for. And at the end of the day, there's always going to be some ambiguity. He then went on to say, quote, now, if there is somebody in this town that would claim that we would consider going to war with Russia over Crimea and eastern Ukraine, they should speak up and be very clear about it. So what Obama was saying is these people demanding that I do more are insane. They what they're essentially saying is we should go to war or risk war with Russia over a country, Ukraine, eastern Ukraine or Crimea, that is of vital interest to them, but not to us. I agreed with Obama in 2012 when he mocked the idea that Russia was our number one geopolitical foe. I thought there were many other greater foes the United States faced than Russia, a country which after the end of the Cold War had become a mid-range power with an economy the size of Italy. I agreed with Obama in 2016 when he was refusing to drown Ukraine and lead the weapons because of how provocative it would be toward Russia over a cause that did not warrant that level of risk. And I agree with Obama now. Why, as an American, would we risk an incredibly dangerous war that could suck the United States or our allies in in order to defend the territorial integrity or the boundaries of Russia, something of great interest to Russia, but not to the United States. And, and that's why there's such a mismatch right now between the rhetoric and the reality. What you're hearing is, look, Putin is Hitler. This is 1938. This is Hitler demanding a part of Czechoslovakia. It's the same thing. And if we give him part of Czechoslovakia, If we give him part of Ukraine, he's then going to, just like Hitler did, go and invade all the other Soviet republics. And it's the same thing. Okay, well, if that's true, if Putin is Hitler, and this is 1938, then we probably should go to war. You go to war with Hitler if he's expanding. You don't ignore it. And yet at the same time, everyone in Washington is saying nobody wants war. Nobody thinks we should go to war with Russia over Ukraine. So what is the point of all of this virtue signaling and all this posturing? That was what Obama was saying. What does it mean to accuse me of being insufficiently aggressive toward Moscow if 
people want to go to war with Russia over Eastern Ukraine or Crimea, let them say so because the idea is insane. And he knew nobody was willing to say that, just like nobody's willing to say that now, precisely because everyone knows, even though you're not allowed to say it, that Obama was right and that the U.S. has no vital interest in Ukraine. There's no reason we should be willing to risk a war with the greatest or the biggest nuclear armed power in the country, in the, in the planet, over Ukraine, a country on the other side of the world that has no vital or direct interest in the United States. Nor should we even be willing to, quote unquote, sacrifice as so many wealthy journalists are do are demanding, telling Americans who are already suffering so much from inflation and other economic hardship, they need to sacrifice even more because our values have a cost. Or democ- defending our freedoms has a cost. How is our how are our freedoms jeopardized by what happens in Ukraine? Of course they're not. No one thinks that. Which is why nobody is proposing the U.S. go to war there. The problem is that when you create a climate this dangerous, this hostile, with so much group thinking, so much lockstep tribalism and, and, and emotion and rage, you can end up in an unintentional war that you don't actually want to be dragged into. That has happened many times throughout history. And this is why I thought what had happened with Russiagate was so dangerous because this was the climate that was being created. And the irony is that while Obama was eager not to confront Putin in any way, as he said explicitly, Trump did confront Putin repeatedly. Trump sent the lethal arms to Ukraine that Obama refused to send. Trump did confront Russia in, 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 in Syria, in fact, threatened Putin and Russia explicitly when Russia had bombed Syria. And most of all, Trump worked very hard to sabotage the most important asset Russia had, which was the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that would allow Russia to sell huge amounts of cheap natural gas to Western Europe and especially to Germany. If Trump were the Russian puppet, subservient to Putin, afraid to challenge Russia that the media for five years claimed he was. Why was it Trump who was willing to confront Russia in all those ways on Ukraine, on Syria, on Nord Stream 2, when Obama was unwilling to and was saying Ukraine is not in our interest, but it's a Russian interest? You would think There'd be some reevaluation of those conspiracy theories and of everything that we were told for five years. It's such an obvious lie about the relationship between the United States and Russia under Trump. The problem was Trump officials, the United States government were forced by this climate into being more confrontational with Russia, even though Trump ran on a platform of wanting better relations with Russia, because every time Trump took a step toward improved relations with Moscow, the media and Democrats seized on that as proof that he was a traitor. That's the reality of what has happened for the last five years. The reason there's such a dangerous relationship between Russia and the United States now. And it's why what happened with Russiagate was so reckless and so dangerous and so reprehensible. You don't play games like that with the two biggest nuclear armed powers in the country, on the planet, rather. Now, the last point I just want to make is... It is, when you look at it, all of these, these events from kind of a step back and you try hard to remove the emotions of what is being provoked. And, you know, again, I mean, nothing is easier than trifling with your emotions in war. We see it all the time. The, the Persian Gulf War was something that most Americans who supported it, it's one of the few wars that people who supported it didn't end up regretting in large part because George Bush 41 refused pressure to expand the purpose of the war from expelling Iraq from Kuwait into regime change, which could have changed the whole way that that war was understood. They did a limited targeted mission that they stuck to. So people generally view that war as positive. But before that war, we were subjected to all kinds of false propaganda stories about how Saddam Hussein was ordering people, uh, his troops to come and pull babies out of incubators. All we now now know totally fabricated, but of course you hear that Saddam Hussein is pulling babies out of incubators 
and you you hate that person. You want to destroy that person. Um, if you look at how any war is conducted with propaganda, there's been a horrific years long war in Yemen involving Saudi Arabia and Iran and the United States and the United Kingdom. But because we don't hear much about it, our emotions are kept in check. If when Gaza and Israel have conflict, you can very easily manipulate someone's reaction. You can show them video of old Israeli women in northern uh, Israel and Haifa terrified about rockets from Hamas. And you think the Palestinians are outrageous. Hamas is evil. Or you can show them video of air raids on schools that kill Gazan children and your emotions are going to be the reverse. The Israelis are at fault. Our emotions are very easily manipulated, especially in war because of how horrific war actually is and how we respond to it. We need to be very careful with ourselves and each other that we think about this rationally. We think about this deliberatively and that we allow space for there to be dissent. And when you look at what has been said, not by fringe Kremlin assets on RT, but by the most mainstream figures, William Burns, the head of the CIA under Biden, Barack Obama, military officials, all of them have been saying the same thing for two decades. NATO expansion into Ukraine is extremely provocative and dangerous and unwise. Ukraine is a vital interest to Russia, but not the United States. It is a clear fact that the U.S. has been heavily involved in trying to control and govern and interfere in Ukrainian domestic affairs right on the Russian border. The whole conflict starts to take on a different hue than this kind of lockstep emotional response we're being forced to have upon pain of being treated like Tulsi Gabbard or Tucker Carlson, namely being accused informally or even formally of being guilty of the crime of treason. And it's the reason it's the worst crime is because it means you've turned against your tribe. You've betrayed your tribe. That's why it's one of the few crimes in, in the U.S. code that is a capital offense and that allows for the death penalty. That needs to stop. We need to be able to debate and question the best way to handle what the U.S. role ought to be in Russia and Ukraine, whether there's a way that we can help stop this war, whether there are things we did that helped contribute to its outbreak. It doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with the other person whose view is being expressed. They should be able to express that without being regarded as traitors or immoral criminals or, or immoral criminals or betrayers of the tribe. And if you just look at the clear facts of what happened in Ukraine, what role the United States played and continues to play and can play in the future, it's clear that there's a lot more for us to be doing than just saying that Vladimir Putin is the new Hitler, that everything is Russia's fault. There's much more constructive things we could be talking about and saying, but in order for that to happen, we need to be able to agree that we're going to have a kind of debate that is not repressive or coercive or designed to intimidate, but that encourages everything to be interrogated and questioned and debated because that's when you have the healthiest form of, of, of political debate. So as you can see, the computer had a little bit of uh, problems in the background, which I think is a sign that it's time to end anyway. I think we've gone an hour and a half now. Um, so I want to thank all of you for listening. Um, I you know, said on social media that the worst possible thing to do is to try and have these kinds of discussions on social media where heretics are try looked for and, and, and hunted down and where your comments are easily distorted. So I thought it was very important to take the time to delve into exactly what it is that my thoughts are and exactly what I think this debate ought to entail. So I hope you found it uh, instructive and, and productive. And I really hope that it's in this spirit that we continue to debate what is a truly volatile and dangerous war. Thanks so much for listening.